Hey, welcome back to Real Analysis. We're going to continue our work in Chapter 5, talking about something that we kind of introduced at the end of Section 5.3 called continuity. We didn't give it that name, but in this Section 5.4, we're going to give it a name and kind of explore it uh, in depth. All right. Uh, like many of the sections uh, in, in Chapter 5, it's organized into lots of subsections. The material that I'm going to focus on in this video lecture comes from the second, third, and fourth subsection of, ch of chapter five of section 5.4. Um, section 5.41, subsection 5.41 rather, um, it kind of introduces this notion of continuity kind of in the language that you, that you would have seen it introduced in your calculus course or maybe even a pre-calculus course. So, so I encourage you to check that out, but I'm going to leave it to your reading. I'm not going to explicitly discuss that material here in this, in this video lecture. All right, so to get going, let's recall that at the end of section 5.3, we looked at a theorem about the limit of a composition. It was theorem 5.25. I'm not going to restate it here. You might want to stop the video and, and uh, open up your book and check out the statement of it to remind yourself of the notation and so on. But in that theorem, there was a function capital F that had to be defined in the neighborhood of this number L. And the limit uh, as Z approached L of that function was equal to the function's value at L. Okay. So, so in particular, uh, it was important that that number L be in the domain of F because after all, we're evaluating F at L. It was important that L be an accumulation point of that domain. Well, because uh, we're taking the limit there. We can only take limits at accumulation points. Uh, and then moreover, that limit exists. That is that the limit exists in equal some number. And in particular, it has to equal F of L. That's what the equality says, All right? So, so we're gonna give a name to uh, a function that has these properties at some point in its domain. We're gonna call it continuous. We're going to say that the function capital F here is continuous. So, so I'm going to kind of make some definitions down below this, but I'm just going to write here to get you used to what I'm talking about. These three conditions are what I'm going to mean by F being continuous at L. It's continuous at L if L is in the domain. I'm going to slightly relax this condition. You'll see what I mean here in a second. Uh, but, but, but for right now, L is in the domain. It's an accumulation point of the domain and the limited L exists and equals the function value. If those three things are true, I'm gonna call this thing continuous, all right? So <clears throat> the author gives a definition of this, but it's, it's kind of some tricky reading I'm going to pass over my comment there. I just kind of made it out loud. Um, the author actually gives several. There's going to be a total of four different definitions. Let me just kind of highlight in the three that you can see right now. Each one of these definitions, the author is defining what we mean by a function being continuous at a point. And so you should probably be a little bit alarmed here because you're saying, well, how can you give three or there's supposedly even a fourth one hidden below the screen down here. I'll show it to you in a second. How can you give more than one definition of the same term? Well, the definitions are all equivalent. I'm going to leave the proofs of that to you as exercises, or we could maybe discuss them briefly in class. But what I mean by that is that a function being continuous at a point by any one of these definitions would be continuous at that point by any of the other definitions. So, so, so they're, they're all equivalent. They're different ways of saying the same thing. This, of course, requires proof. And like I say, I'm going to omit the proof from, from this video lecture itself. Uh, let me start with the limit version. I'm going to start with definition 5.33, the so-called limit version of continuity, because it's the way we were just talking about it. So f is a function defined on some set. Uh, in function notation, let me just kind of annotate here. It means that f has domain a and takes functions in the real values. So it's defined on some set. Uh, and then x0 is a point of a. So it's in the domain. It's the first condition that I wrote above for that number l. So I'm going to say that f is continuous. Well, just kind of by default, if, if, if x0 is an isolated point in a, then it's continuous. All right, so we're just going to say that's by default, that every function is continuous at every one of its isolated points. Otherwise, if it's not an isolated point, it's an accumulation point of the set. Okay, and in that case, I can speak about the limit, and I'm going to say it's continuous if the limit exists and equals the function value there. 
So just like in the opening part of the video lecture. So that's the so-called limit version of, of continuity. One nice reason this so-called epsilon delta version, let me jump up here and talk about definition 532, you can kind of avoid that hassle of distinguishing between isolated points and accumulation points. You can just say, well, if you take any point in the domain, and I'll say it's continuous at that point, if you give me any epsilon, I can find a delta so that the function values are within f of x naught, or are within epsilon of x naught, provided the inputs in the domain are within delta of x naught. All right, so if x naught is an accumulation point, you can see that epsilon delta version, that's exactly the definition of limit, right? So that's our epsilon delta definition of limit. So that's kind of a hint as to why these two things are the same. The epsilon delta version just sort of allows you to include the isolated point. I'll make a comment about that. All right, five, three, four. Again, it's just kind of the same thing. It's the so-called neighborhood version. If if you take a x naught in a, I'll say f is continuous if for every open set that contains f of x naught. So if you're an open set B containing f of x naught, you contain some epsilon neighborhood of x naught. So, so that's kind of the equivalent of saying for every epsilon, uh, you can find some open set that is some delta neighborhood around x naught, so that if you're in that delta neighborhood, you're in the epsilon neighborhood. So the neighborhood version of this definition is, is really, again, it's just sort of a rephrasing of the technical parts of the definition. Uh, using kind of slightly different notions. So there are some hints, some comments about how to prove that these definitions are, are equivalent, but I certainly didn't write out the proofs. And like I say, I'm not going to. Let me show you one more. Maybe I can try to keep two of those things visible. This, this, this fourth one, definition 535, based on our work in chapter two, it's gonna be the one that I wanna try to use the most. It gives me a way of thinking of this continuity condition in terms of a sequence. All right, so once again, if I have some function defined on the set A and an element of the domain, that's always common in all four of these definitions, then I'm gonna call that function continuous at X naught. If you take any sequence of points in A that converge to X naught, Notice I'm dropping the condition that none of the sequence points have to equal x naught. They may. x naught's in the domain, so I don't mind if x sub n is equal to x naught sometimes. All right, so, so in particular, x naught could be an isolated point. This sequence could be a constant sequence, for example. Uh, but, but for every sequence of points xn and a, if, if the image sequence f of xn converges to f of x naught, then I'll call the function continuous at x naught. Okay? So four different wordings of the same notion, continuous at a point. You can think about it, I won't scroll, but you can think about it in terms of epsilons and deltas. You can think about it in terms of limits. You can think about it in terms of these neighborhoods, these epsilon and delta neighborhoods. You can think about it sequentially. But in all cases, they, they, uh, we, we, we always will say that the function is continuous at this point, x naught. Let's look at an example. <clears throat> I'm going to take the function f uh, uh, from the natural numbers to the real numbers def defined by uh, f of n is 1 over n squared. F's a sequence, right? It's a sequence uh, if you want to think of it that way. I'm thinking of it as a function on the natural numbers here. So in particular, my, my, my set A is the set of natural numbers. The domain of this function is the set of natural numbers, right? So I claim that if you pick any natural number, if you pick any natural number n naught, n sub zero, I claim that f is continuous at that point. And how to prove that? Well, I'm gonna use the sequential definition here. If you take a sequence, say x sub k, I'm gonna use k because I've already kind of used n to denote n naught. If you take any sequence x sub k in the natural numbers that converges to n naught, well, then eventually it has to be constant. Yeah, a sequence of natural numbers that's converging to some natural number eventually would just have to be constant at that natural number. Because if I took epsilon less than one, natural numbers differ by at least one. So if their difference is going to be less than one, it has to be zero. So, so a convergent sequence of natural numbers that converges to a natural number has to eventually be constant. 
So for some capital N, XK is just N naught, all right? Okay, well then the image sequence is eventually constant. The image sequence is just eventually one over N naught squared, and that's exactly F of N naught. So that converges, okay? So by the sequential uh, uh, criteria, this function is continuous. The exact same argument actually says that any sequence, not just one over n, not n squared, but any sequence is continuous at any natural number. Okay, and then I've written this kind of strange statement uh, and maybe you already feel it. It probably should bother you, if, especially if you read sex subsection 5.4.1 or when you're thinking of continuity, you're kind of thinking of it like it was defined in calculus. In calculus, people usually say something like, oh, a function is continuous if you can, or in pre-calculus anyway, functions continuous if you can draw it without picking up your pencil, right? So a function that looks like this, it's not continuous, but if, but if you can draw the function without picking up your pencil, it looks continuous. But a sequence, well, you can't draw the graph of a sequence without picking up your pencil. A graph of a sequence is just a bunch of dots. So, so if you uh, have a friend in Math 109 and you draw them a picture like this and you ask them like, is this function continuous? They're probably gonna say no that that function's jumping all over the place. But in our technical sense, see for us, continuous depends on the domain. Our technical definition, uh, you know, these points in the sequence, I could, if, I, if I would have used the limit definition, every point in the natural numbers is an isolated point. So the function is continuous there by definition. Every point is, is an isolated point. So, so our, our notion of con continuity, it captures that old notion, you know, but, but in some sense, it's a little wider. So you have to kind of let go of that. I can draw the function without picking up my pencil notion. That, that's not, that's not the, the way we want to kind of think about this. All right, good. Okay. So just one more kind of way of saying that here is, is what I've written out, that if you take an isolated point, well, by the uh, limit definition above, the function is automatically continuous there. But if you kind of want to see the neighborhood version of that, well, if you're an isolated point, there's some neighborhood around you that the only element of A in that neighborhood is X zero. That's the definition of isolated point, right? So, so if you take X within Delta, uh, X in A within Delta of X zero, you have to take it to be X zero. So, so such a function is always going to be continuous there, right? So, so it's just kind of a, a consequence of our definitions. We want to allow it, but I'm going to tell you that we're most often the quote unquote interesting limits are our limits at places where a X zero is an accumulation point of the domain. So continuity at an isolated point is not, is not a particularly interesting subject is what I'm trying to say. Okay, let's look at a second example where we can use that epsilon delta definition. So this is going to feel a little bit more like what continuity felt like in calculus. Let's, let's take the set A to be the, the positive real numbers and define F to be 1 over X squared. So, so it's a function of the real variable X, positive real variable X. Its uh, output is 1 over X squared. So I claim that that function is continuous at every X naught. And, and let's first give a sequential proof first going to give a sequential proof of it. So you're using that sequential criteria above. I'd have to scroll back up to, to, um, to get the number. I think it's 5.34, but let me not, let me not say that. Write it down. You can, you can back up the video and check it out. So, so, okay, A is the set of positive real numbers. It's an open set. So every point in an open set is an accumulation point of that set. Every point is interior. Okay, so, so if we can take, we can take a sequence in A that converges to X naught, X naught's not zero because it's an element of A. Okay, and then using uh, uh, limit properties, this is why the sequential criteria is sort of the best way to prove this kind of stuff. Using a limit property from chapter two, because X naught's not zero, F of XN, which is one over XN squared, converges to one over X naught squared, right? Limits of quotients converge to the quotient of the limits. That's a chapter two theorem. One over X naught squared is exactly F of X naught. So, so this thing is continuous by five, three, five. Yeah, that's sorry, that's the sequential criteria. Five, three, five. Didn't read my own notes. Cool. 
So the sequence proofs of limits and continuity now usually go pretty fast. We're not sweeping details under the rug. It's just that we're, we're enjoying all of that foundational work we laid down in chapter two. We know a lot about sequences, so why not take advantage of that? Okay, well, let me give you a sense of what you'd have to kind of go through if you wanted to use the epsilon delta definition. The epsilon delta definition is the one that's 5.32 continuity, same function. Okay, so I'm just gonna kind of illustrate how you might think about this if you were interested in using an epsilon delta argument. I'm gonna pick a specific X naught. Uh, you can change it to, to an arbitrary X naught throughout my proof, but, but just, it, just to make it slightly less abstract and easier to write down, I picked X naught equal to four. You can pick any, any number you want. So like usual with an epsilon delta argument, you have to do a little bit of background because the, the statement says, given an epsilon, there exists a delta where you got to find the delta. All right, so given an epsilon, what do I want? I want the function outputs one over x squared within the output at four, one over 16. I want that to be less than epsilon when, uh, uh, when x is close to delta, right? Uh, I, I want it to be in a deleted neighborhood. I don't want x to be four, but just close to four. Okay, so I got to find the delta. Well, I do a little bit of math on that yellow highlighted inequality with epsilon. Right, if I just kind of get a common denominator of x squared times 16 and rearrange it, that's equivalent to this thing being less than epsilon. Use some properties of absolute value, factor, uh, uh, well, first of all, x squared minus 16 and 16 minus x squared or squared are the same in absolute value. Factor that numerator and use properties of absolute values. So that's equivalent to that being less than epsilon. So then when I'm looking at this thing, x minus four is the term that I can control. So I'm trying to control it to find delta. So basically I wanna bound that part that I'm putting the blue brackets around. I'd like to find some number that I know was bigger than x plus four over the absolute value of 16 x squared. That the absolute value in the denominator is vestigial because 16 and x squared are all positive. But I'd like to replace that blue bracketed expression with some number that's bigger than it because then I can control the X minus four to make that less than that number times epsilon, right? So this should kind of start to feel like familiar arguments. We've done this before. So in order to bound it, of course, X plus four is not gonna be less than or equal to some number for all X, but I'm not interested in all X, I'm interested in X near four. So temporarily for a second, I'll just say, well, let's stay within one unit of four. You know, if you like, try, try taking delta to be equal to one. And I'm gonna let you check all the details of the absolute value computations. Come ask me about it if, if you need some help. But if X minus four and absolute value is less than one, then X plus four would be between seven and nine. Okay. Uh, and moreover, uh, X then would be uh, what? Between three and five. So X squared would be between nine and 25, so 16 X squared, I hope I did my arithmetic correctly, would be between 144 and 400. So, so I'm most interested in this inequality, 16 X squared is at least 144 because then one over it is less than one over 144. I also know that X plus four and hence the absolute value of X plus four because it's positive is no more than nine. All right, so that blue bracketed expression is less than nine over 144 if X is within one unit of four, okay? The blue bracketed expression, I'm just gonna kind of write it in laser pointer here. This number is less than nine over 144. Cool. So epsilon times that would be epsilon times 144, uh, so, sorry, epsilon times the reciprocal of that would be epsilon times 144 over nine. So if that made any sense, then it's not such a mystery why I'm gonna come down here and say, all right, given this epsilon, I'll take delta to be whichever is smaller, one or 144 over nine times epsilon, right? Uh, if, if, if X minus four is less than Delta in absolute value, well then in particular, it's less than one 
right? Because delta is the minimum of those two numbers. And if X is less than one, everything that's written above here holds, right? But it's also less than 144 uh, uh, over uh, nine times epsilon because delta is the minimum of those two things. So it's both. So then I just do the algebra again. I start off with my function difference, rewrite it like that, split off the X plus four and I'm replacing, um, I'm replacing x plus four over 16 x squared with uh, nine over 144. That's the blue brackets above, right? So the algebra above is what justifies that. And then the x plus x minus four, excuse me, is less than delta. So, so in particular, it's less than this number 144 epsilon over nine. Uh, 144 times epsilon over nine times nine over 144 is epsilon. Cool. So, so uh, uh, it remains to write the proof. I'm not gonna write out all the sentences here, but what we've shown is given an epsilon, we found a delta, namely the minimum of these two numbers, so that if X minus four is less than delta, the function difference F of X minus F of four is less than epsilon, and that precisely means that uh, f is continuous at x equals four. So you can compare the sequential argument to the epsilon delta argument and then ask yourself which one you, which one you like, uh, like to write more, right? It's important to be able to write them both, uh, but, but I personally felt like the sequential argument was a little smoother. Okay, so kind of moving along here, uh, you can do it with any of the four definitions, but, but certainly the easiest way, the computationally cheapest way is to use that sequential criteria for continuity, 535. Five. I'm gonna denote the sequential criteria just briefly below uh, by SCC. So sequential criteria for continuity, sort of like our sequential criteria for limits. Uh, so if you combine that with all of those limit laws that we learned in chapter two, then you can show quite easily that there's a vast majority of functions that are continuous at, at, at points in their domain. For example, like any, I'm gonna leave the details to you, but any constant function is continuous at any point in its domain. Uh, power functions, functions that look like X to the N where N is a positive number, e even, even rationals, but we haven't really talked about things like uh, uh, X to the M over N and so on, but, but those things are also continuous at X and R. Right. If you if you have a, a, if n is not a, a natural number, if it's a rational number, well then then, then the domain of, of those power functions, you know, you can, like square roots, for example, the one half power doesn't have entire domain, so you have to be a little bit careful about where you're saying something is continuous. But power functions are continuous. Polynomial functions are just uh, constants times power functions added together. So all those limit laws would say they're continuous. Yeah. So, so if you like, three is true because uh, one and two together uh, imply it. Yeah, if constant functions are continuous and, and whole number powers of, uh, are continuous, then polynomials are continuous. The limit laws all justify that. Polynomials are just sums of constants times powers. In fact, you can use the, uh, um, well, and products, yeah, yeah, pro products of constant times powers. Um, you, you can use um, the, the quotient limit laws. Any rational function is gonna be continuous at any place where its denominator is zero. Rational functions are just ratios of polynomials, P over Q, and as long as Q is not zero, the limit of a fraction is the fraction of the limits. Yeah, so all that work we laid in chapter two is, is allowing us to really speed up our, our, our work here. We don't have to go back and do, you know, for a given rational function, it wouldn't be very hard to write an example down where the epsilon delta proof of its continuity at a place where its denominator is not zero could be really difficult. Depends on the degrees of P and Q, but it could be very difficult to work out what the delta is in terms of epsilon for an arbitrary rational function. You know, we kind of got a taste of that when we were looking at, at um, the epsilon definition of, uh, of sequence congruence back in, in chapter two. The, the limit laws facilitate these computations. Once you have those limit laws, you can sort of combine functions to get more and more complicated things. And the limit laws tell you how, how all the limits are, are behaving. Cool.
Let's take an example of a function that's very interesting and it's not continuous. Uh, um, so here, this thing's not a polynomial or a rational function. I'm gonna just call it f to be boring here. It's a function on the entire real line. It's piecewise defined and its value is one if x is a rational number and zero if it's not. Okay, any number in the real line is either rational or irrational. So this is a well-defined function. Uh, uh, in a lot of texts uh, and in the literature, it's often named after a French mathematician, Dirichlet. So it's sometimes called Dirichlet's function. Uh, it's also kind of into, a, it fits into a family, a, a more general idea, which I won't, I won't discuss right now, but it's, it's, it's also called the characteristic function on the rationals. But I think for, for us here, we'll, we'll call it Dirichlet's function. All right. So Dirichlet's function, it's, its value is one, it has two outputs. Its range has two elements in it. It's one if X is rational, it's zero if X is irrational, okay? I claim that Dirichlet's function, and you're probably not surprised by this, it's not continuous. And by the way, not continuous can also be pronounced discontinuous. So if I say a function is discontinuous at a point, I mean, it's not continuous there. And Dirichlet's function is not continuous at any point in the real numbers, okay? So, so how to prove that? Well, I'm gonna kind of think about the sequential criteria. Let me sort of just expose most of the argument here. So pick any real number. I'm gonna to try to convince you that Dirichlet's function is not continuous there. Let's just proceed by cases. If that real number is rational, then I'm gonna take a sequence of irrational numbers that converge to it, okay? You can always do that by the density of the, of the rational numbers. There's always a sequence, or and, and the density of the irrational numbers. There's always a sequence of irrational numbers because any open interval contains an irrational number. In fact, any open interval contains both kinds of numbers. So, so you, you, given your rational number x naught, take a sequence of irrational numbers that converge to it, okay? So if all those numbers are irrational, xn is irrational for every n, then the function's value on them is all zero. So the image sequence f of xn is constant, and so it converges to its constant value, okay? But, but f of x0 itself is one because uh, x0 is a rational number. So this function cannot be continuous. If it were continuous at x0, this sequence would have to converge to the function value, but zero is not equal to one, all right? And you can flip that around completely. If you take x zero to not be rational, if it's an irrational number, well, then take a sequence of rational numbers that converges to it. You can do that because every open interval contains both the irrational and irrational numbers. It's, a, it's x, any irrational number is an accumulation point for Q in our fancy language. So this time the image sequence is constantly one everything in the sequence is rational. So, so the image sequence is one, constant sequence converges to its constant value. But, but f of x zero is zero because x is irrational, x zero is irrational, okay? So, so uh, it's not continuous at, at an irrational number either. Nice. You can try an epsilon delta argument of that same thing. You know, the, the idea that we used in that proof in example five, it's useful enough to get its own name. I'm gonna call it the discontinuity criteria. So what we basically just said is if you take some subset of the real numbers and a function on it, and you take a point in the domain, then a function is discontinuous at that if and only if you can find there exists a sequence in that domain that converges to x naught, but the image sequence does not converge to f of x naught. So I just used that twice. Uh, I took an X naught in the rationals and I found a, a sequence that converged to zero, but F of, of, of X zero was one. And then I took a sequence of irrationals that converged. Uh, well, I'm, I'm saying the numbers backwards. <laughs> yeah, that's what we did. We took an, in both cases in the above proof, I found a sequence converging to X zero, but the image sequence did not converge to F of X zero. Let me just say it like that. Okay, this video is getting a little long, but I wanted to kind of end with one more illustration of this discontinuity. I think this is kind of a cool picture. So, so this time I'm gonna define a function on all real numbers. 
I'm bringing in a trigonometric function here, which technically speaking, we haven't um, we haven't really introduced in the course, but 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 I wanted to to have some some interesting examples. So so this function uh, f of x, it's sine of one over x if x is not zero, and it's zero if x is zero. So I've got its quote unquote graph drawn to the right over here. Uh, and, and why does the graph look like that? Well, as x goes to zero, one over x is going to go to infinity. Uh, and so the sine function being periodic, you know, uh, it gonna, it's going to repeat its values every time its input goes through an interval of, of length two pi. And one over x is going to go through intervals of length two pi, quote unquote, faster and faster. So this thing kind of oscillates faster and faster as you get near the origin. The kind of dark region in the middle here is just the sort of software pixelation problem of, of you know, no, no software is going to be able to graph that function, but you can just kind of imagine those waves, the, the frequency, uh, the, the distance between two peaks, if you like, is just getting smaller and smaller. So I claim that f is not continuous at zero, and I'm going to do it with a sequential argument. Okay. So, so uh, down here, let me start kind of highlighting. Let me define a sequence xn. It looks a little bit mysterious, but, but I'm going to define it as 2 over the number pi times 4 pi n, where n is a natural number. OK? I claim that xn goes to 0 as n goes to infinity, uh, and I'm going to ask you why. I'm going to leave that detail to you. So, so the sequence xn goes to 0. But if you do a little bit of math, 1 over xn is always a positive number. I've done the math. 1 over xn is pi over 2 plus 2 pi n. All right. So f of it, f of xn is the sine of pi over 2 plus 2 pi n. Well, the sine of pi over 2 is 1. And if you add any multiple of 2 pi to that, the, the value stays 1. So, so the image sequence is a constant. I've actually plotted that image sequence up here. I just picked my x sub n strategically so that their reciprocals were always going to have sine equal to one. All right. So you can see those, those x sub n's up there, the y values on all those red points is one. All right. So, so uh, if you have a constant sequence one, it converges to one, but f of zero is not one. So, so therefore, the function f is not continuous at, at, at uh, 0, because I found a sequence converging to 0, but uh, its image, uh, um, uh, it's, uh, sorry, sorry, I should have pointed here. The sequence converges to 0, but its image doesn't converge to f of 0. So it's not continuous. In fact, I don't know if I should zoom out when I do this or, or try to. Um, just scroll back to the picture. That function cannot be continuous no matter how you define its value at zero. So to prove that, that's what the blue dots are doing. If I take another sequence, yn is 1 over 2 pi n, OK? Then those terms also go to 0, but f of every one of them is 0. You can see that in the picture, the y-coordinate of all those blue dots. The blue dots are getting closer and closer to 0. Their, their x-coordinates are. Uh, and their y-coordinates are always 0. So, so that sequence converges to 0. OK, so <clears throat> I've got two different sequences, xn and yn. They both converge to 0. Uh, uh, but their limits, or their, sorry, their images have different values. f of xn converges to 1, f of yn converges to 0. So therefore, it's impossible to define the function f in such a way that all image sequences would converge to the same number. <clears throat> so, so the way people say this is that that discontinuity at 0 is not removable, OK? There's no way to redefine f of 0 to make that function continuous at 0. It's a so-called non-removable discontinuity. Okay, So no matter how you tried to define f of 0, maybe, maybe when I gave you my first example written in red, you thought, hey, just switch the value uh, of f of 0 to be 1. OK, you could. 
but then there's some other reason why it's not going to be continuous at zero. And no matter how you try to define f of zero, it's not going to be continuous. Okay, it's almost time to stop this long video. I'm just going to end with one more definition. It's definition 536 in your book, although I wrote it out by hand. Uh, we've been talking about continuity at a point during this whole video lecture. So, so I might also speak about a function being continuous on a whole set. So if I say a function is continuous on a whole set, I mean that it's continuous at x for every x in that set. Okay. So, so continuous on A just means it's continuous at X for every X in A. If A is all real numbers, we usually just drop all the language and just say F is continuous. So if I'm talking about a function that's continuous, I mean it's continuous on the real numbers. And by that, I mean it's continuous at X for every real number X, okay? So just to kind of cycle through some examples of that before we end the video, constant functions are continuous. They're continuous at every real number. So we're power functions. Consequently, so are polynomials. Rational functions, I can't just say they're continuous, uh, but rational functions are continuous on their domains. That is, they're continuous on the set of real numbers where the denominators aren't zero. And then I kind of wanted just to say, and I've used this one example above, the sine function, but we don't have rigorous definitions of these things, so, so I can't kind of prove these statements right now, but other functions that you know from calculus are continuous, the sine function, the cosine function, tangent and cotangent, all the trig functions, they're continuous on their domains, right? The tangent function is not defined for every x, but, but it is continuous at every x for which it is defined. Exponential functions are continuous and so on and so on. Okay, so uh, this was a long one. Let's stop it there. Thanks for listening.